William H. Johnson was born in 1901 in Florence, South Carolina. He grew up in poverty and like many of his generation had little education. His father, supposedly a prominent white member of the community, did nothing to help. His mother later married and had four more children. The stepfather was a hard worker until he was injured in an accident and unable to work. Johnson's mother cooked, washed, and ironed for white families to feed her children. The oldest child, William, did fill work during the seasons, helped at home, looked after his younger brothers and sisters. William began copying comic strips at an early age. A teacher who saw him drawing pictures in the dirt gave him some art supplies, pencils and paper. By the time he reached his teens, William had left school to help support his family, but had decided to become an artist. Around 1919, at 17, he left South Carolina for New York, seeking work with his uncle. He worked for several years as a stevedore, cook, and a hotel porter before he could afford to study art. From 1921 to 1926, he attended the National Academy of Design, known for his high standards and rigorous training. He did well, winning several prizes and the attention of Charles Hawthorne, a teacher who took him under his wing. This is a painting from his student years. This is a self-portrait from 1923, all around 1923 and 1926. His teacher, Hawthorne, heavily influenced his work. Again, this is 1921. 23 this is a still life so you can see how his early work looks so that as you continue to look at his work you can see how it grows in the summer of 1923 through 1925 he followed his teacher Hawthorne to the Cape Cod School of Art at Providence Town you're looking at a group photo from the Cape Cod uh, school from 1925 Hawthorne helped him financially by providing summer work and arranging for free tuition. Although Johnson won other awards over the next several years, he received the least highly prized award to study in Europe for a year. Blaming it on prejudice, Hawthorne raised enough money for Johnson to go to Europe. By 1926, when he graduated, Johnson went to Paris where he studied modern art. He soon moved to the south of France where he began rapidly developing his style and this is him in Paris in 1927. One of the most potent influences on Johnson during that period was the work of Sautine with its use of distorted forms to express emotion and mode and so this is a still life on burlap and you can see the difference from this still life. Um, when you compare it to the first one we saw. He was also influenced by the work of the prominent artists of the day, such as Gauguin, Van Gogh, and Cezanne. And this is another one of his um, still lifes on canvas from 1927. You can see that he's growing, he's grappling with his style. This looks very much like uh, it's been influenced by Cezanne. Painting in this sort of expressionist style, Johnson began to exhibit his work in the late 1920s. Like other expressionists, William, William's work was intense and emotional during this period. He met and impressed the African-American expatriate artist Henry O. Tanner. This is a painting he made in 1928 called The Streets of Canard sur Mer. This is a self-portrait that he made in 1929. He met his future wife, Holcha Crane, a fellow artist, 15 years his senior, who specialized in weaving and ceramics. Traveling with Holcha, he had the opportunity to visit museums throughout Europe, which must have been both an exhilarating as well as a, dis a depressing experience for him. He became aware of just how difficult success would be for an artist in Europe where he was just one more talented among many artists. And of course, the additional handicap or prejudice of being a African-American artist. Hoping 
winning recognition in, in America would be a step forward. He returned to the U.S. late in 1929. Another black artist he had met in Paris told him that winning an award from the Harmon Foundation would be easy, so he entered six pictures in this competition. The Harmon judges were greatly impressed by his work. They awarded him a gold medal and picked four of his paintings for the exhibit. This is one of them. This is called The Young Pastry Cook, 1928, 1930. And again, you can see how his style is developing, how his expressionistic style is developing. An excited Johnson headed back to Florence, South Carolina to visit his family and show his paintings to his mother. While there, he made paintings of a few of the young black residents, like this painting called Girl in a Green Dress from 1939. I'm sorry, 1930. This is Jim. This is a portrait of William's 16-year-old brother. Again, this is also from 1930. This is Doug, also from the same time period. And this is Minnie from 1930. So you can see some beautiful expressionistic uh, portraits of his family members and community. His work was exhibited locally and a story appeared in a local newspaper. However, several days later, he was arrested and jailed for loitering by the police while painting this local landmark called Jacobin Hotel. The building at one time was considered an elegant and respectable place in the 1980s, yet by 1930, it was dilapidated. It was an old boarding house filled with transients and prostitutes. This experience angered Johnson so much that he returned to Europe and did not return to the South for another 15 years. By 1930, Johnson married a Danish textile artist, Holga Crane, and moved to Kurtman, Denmark, which was a small fishing village where he worked productively. This is a picture of uh, William and Ho Chun in their studio in Denmark from 1930. Scandinavia inspired landscapes. This period marked the height of the artist's expressionistic phase. The name of this painting is called Sun Setting Denmark. This is from 1930. And you can see he's abstracting even further his images. This is Still Life and Fruit from 1931. In 1932, he and his wife also traveled through Norway and North Africa, studying traditional crafts and art in both cultures before returning to Denmark. The name of this, this is a study that he did. This is called poppy fills in Africa from 1932 and this looks like it might be a watercolor. In 1932 they studied weaving and pottery in Tunisia. This is another one of his studies called Arcade Tunisia 1932. This is the Old Salt Denmark from 1931-1932. This is a self-portrait so at this time, making a living was difficult in the 1930s, but Johnson continued to paint. Those travels uh, strongly influenced Johnson's later mature style. He appreciated the very expressive boldness and naivete qualities of the indigenous works that he and his wife had uh, encountered. This is one of his paintings, and as you can see, his his style is becoming even more and more abstracted. This is called View Down Archer Gate Oslo. This is 1935. Again in 1935, this is called Volda Winter, 1935. This is called Harbor Lofton, Norway, 1937. With the threat of war in Europe in 1933, and fearing the impact that Nazism would have on a black artist and his white wife, the couple moved to New York in 1938. Johnson's return to New York encountered another important influence, the intensity and the excitement of life in Harlem. Even though William Holcha had a studio apartment in Chelsea close to Greenwich Village, life was still difficult. Johnson could not find work, and the interracial couple 
experienced a lot of prejudice. This is one of the paintings, the landscapes or cityscapes that he created in 1939 when he got back to the U.S. It's called Harlem Cityscape with Church. Not only did he create landscapes when he got back to Harlem, but he also created images of nude figures. This is simply called Female Nude from 1939. And this is also called Nude from 1939. This was a radical painting for 1939 and today. You have this big, beautiful, black, sensuous, dark-skinned woman who this type of painting would have never been made at that particular time. And you can even say today, even by today's time. It was impossible to find a sponsor in depression era America. Johnson had had to stand in line behind other more successful artists to get a position with the Works Progress Administration, or as we call it, the WPA. Finally, he was hired to teach art at a local community center in Harlem. This is one of the paintings he made in around 1939-1940. It's called Café. During this period, Johnson began to change his style of painting yet again. Previously, he had painted landscapes and people in what is referred to as a full brush style based on the influences of the, the Expressionist. This is called Blind Singer from 1940. And note that he is being influenced by his environment. These are people that he would have encountered being in Harlem. Now, Johnson began to paint in what he termed a primitive style, using bright colors and contrasting colors and two-dimensional figures and objects, combining his interest in modernism primitive art and african-american life this is johnson's mature style this is called string band from 1940 again these are black people he would have encountered in harlem at the time that he was there in the streets of harlem i should say around 1939 to 1940 johnson started to explore and create southern folkloric images based on his imagination of people, places, and activity, such as this synthesized modern version of rural subjects. This is called Chain Gang from 1939 and 1940. This is something he would have seen in the South, so I don't know how much of a folklore it is. Um, the Chain Gangs, my understanding, in certain parts of the South are still going on. But what you can see in this um, painting is Look at the patterns and look at the shapes, the repetitiveness of those shapes. His best paintings characteristically place flattened figures in a limited and high key palette on the abstract ground, depicting scenes of daily life with great personality and intensity, such as this painting called Folk family from 1939-1940, we see some of the same types of shapes that we saw in his previous paintings like the um, chain gang. We see the repetitiveness of the fence. We see those same lines in the back being the fill, the fills. Um, we just see the same shape repeated. It's very fascinating, this type of um, painting. This is called I Baptize D from 1940. And again, Break Down with a Flat Tire, 1940. Um, this is, again, look at the repetitiveness of the tires, the horizontal bands, the vertical bands. Very, this is a really, these are really beautiful, complicated, abstracted compositions. You have to really think about what's going to work next to each other. This is also called Breakdown from 1940. His work was shown in two exhibits. It seems that success must follow, but with the coming of World War II, public attention turned elsewhere. 
This painting called Going to Church from 1940 resembles an African-American quilt or a West African woven cloth. The thing that I want you to pay attention to is look at the groupings of twos in his paintings from the wagon wheels to the two people in the back of the wagon to the two people in front of the wa wagon and how the horse's um, legs are also put in V's of twos, the trees in the back twos, two crosses. This is an incredibly, again, complicated composition of, of shapes and colors put together. These are some of the things that he would have had to be uh, thinking of as he's telling the narrative. This is called Sewing from 1940. Again, notice his repetitiveness of using some of the same shapes. This is called Jitterbug, 1940-1941. Of course, this was the dance craze of young people in the 1940s. This is an example. The Jitterbug was so popular until he made another painting called The Jitterbug 2 from 1942. And just in case you didn't understand the Jitterbug, the Jitterbug and the Lindy Hop were the most popular dances at that time. Here's an example of the Lindy Hop.
Jitterbug and Lindy Hop. These were very popular dances at that time in Harlem. This is another one of William H. Johnson's paintings called Jitterbug 5 from 1942. And again, you can see some of the similar images, but I think really watching that dance, it really helps you to appreciate his shapes. In 1941, Johnson had a solo exposition at the Alma Reed Galleries in New York City on 57th Street. It was the first exhibit of his African-American folk-inspired paintings. It was reviewed by two major art journals, Art Digest and Art News, all the big newspapers in New York as well. And this is a photograph of him at that exposition in 1942 at Alma Reed's gallery. After Pearl Harbor was bombed, a national exposition was put together to inform the public of war called American Artist Re Record of War and Defense. Like many other artists, Johnson began to paint patriotic pictures of soldiers. And this is one of them. It's called Crude Drill from 1942. This is called 10 Miles to Camp from 1942. This is Army Training, same year. This is called Station Stop Red Cross Ambulance, 1942. Again, when you're looking at these uh, paintings, look at the repetitiveness of certain shapes. So you gotta look around the entire composition. This is called Teacher from 1942. Just as success seemed likely, Johnson faced tragedy. A fire in his studio in 1942 destroyed most of his work and his possessions. In early 1943, his work began to be noticed. Moon over Harlem, which is the name of this painting that was made in 1943, is Johnson's version of the 1943 Harlem riot. Several of the figures were taken from the newspaper photos of the rioters, showing beaten and bloodied suspects, underage offenders wearing stolen top hats and tuxedos. Three uniformed men turn a black woman rioter with a breast exposed upside down. We could see it in the center. Again, look at the patterns that he has created in this piece. In 1944, William's wife died of breast cancer. Johnson had already began to display odd behavior before his wife's death. Now grief-stricken, he gradually descended into mental illness. And of course, this is a photograph of his wife. A close friend of the couple, Helen Harrington, stated that it was after his wife's death that Johnson began to paint religious themes, such as this one called Jesus and the Three Marys from 1939 to 1944. This is called Mount Calvary, 1944. And this is his lamination, descended from the cross, again, 1944. And as you're looking at his images, again, always look for the repetitiveness of the shapes. Brokenhearted, he returned to Florence, South Carolina, seeking comfort and support from home. Johnson returned home to visit his mother in 1944. He painted several portraits of her and other relatives. This is his painting called Mom Alice from 1944. This is called Mom and Dad from 1944. William created a double portrait of his mother and perhaps his real father. This is called Folk Family from 1944. This is Sis and Little Sis from 1944. This is a very popular image called Little Sis from 1944. Three Friends from 1944. I want you to pay attention to how his images change and how now you start to see his images with plain backgrounds. And if you compare that to the images we saw previously, breakdown, chain gain, there was always activity and they were outside, right? Now they're all, the shapes 
or portraits are kind of isolated with one color. This is called Swing Low Sweet Chariot. This is 1944. Again, notice these images. This is a self-portrait that he made in 1944. During this time, he painted himself from three different sides. And already you should start thinking three different sides. Is this three different sides of his personality? Three different sides of his psychosis? What is this three different sides? Johnson got a job at the Navy Yard and planned to return to Denmark. He thought that he would marry his wife's widow sister, Irma. This is a uh, painting by Johnson of Carl Van Vechten from 1944. He worked and saved for the next few years doing a historical series about famous women and men in African-American history, such as Abraham Lincoln from 1945. Look at how he composes his images. They become even more uh, folk artish, right? Nat Turner, he, um, Nat Turner, uh, Frederick Douglass, John Brown, Harriet Tugman, these are all people who were part of the racial equality struggle in America. And these are the people that he made paintings of. And as I said, this is Nat Turner from 1945. This is called Let My People Free, 1945. This piece is also about prominent figures in black history, but from a more surreal kind of perspective or sort of a made up kind of history. The name of this piece is Haile Selassie from 1945. He was an emperor of Ethiopia from 1930 to 1974 and a god to the Rastafarian movement in Jamaica. Haile Selassie is viewed by many as the figurehead of African independence for his defiance against the Italian colonial invasion in the 1930s. Uh, again, this is his honoring Haile Selassie. Uh, and it was made in 1945. This is called Underground from 1945. William Johnson's mental illness worsened when he left for Denmark in 1946. Arriving in Denmark, he stayed with his late wife's family for a while. He even brought his wife's body back in an urn and acted kind of strangely. Next, he moved to Copenhagen where Irma, his wife's widow sister lived. Johnson proposed that she take Hocha's place as his wife. She allowed him to move into her tiny flat with her daughter Karen and her husband and her child. I'd like to read a little bit from the book called Homecoming, The Art and Life of William Johnson because it really gives you a little bit of an insight on what was happening. So Apparently, at some point, Irma, Erna tells Williams that he could have his meals with them, but he couldn't live at the place. He couldn't sleep at the place. So Johnson was hurt by Erna's decree and probably a little angry at himself for not seeing what a strain he had put on her family. He marched off that evening into the cold winter air with his burlap sack filled with art and personal belongings and wounded pride dragged behind him. For the next few months, he shuttled back and forth between Ernest Place cheap rooming houses in around Copenhagen and the city streets. Joanna Marie Eggenberg, whose family had come to Copenhagen during this period to see Erna and several other close friends, actually saw Johnson one night on the street not far from Ernest's apartment. It was cold, Joanna Marie remembered. He was surrounded by bundles of clothing and art and was wearing a pair of old workers' shoes painted metallic gold. They stopped to talk with him and later that evening they all congregated at Ernest's place for refreshments. Joanna Marie then discovered that although Johnson 
presented a poverty-stricken appearance, he had the economic resources, although apparently not the desire, to move into a hotel. At that time, Johnson had in his possession at least 6,000 American dollars, money earned and scrupulously saved from art sales in his two-year stint as an, at the uh, Navy Yards. According to Johnson, he had been picked up several evenings earlier by local authorities for vag vagrancy and brought to the police station. When asked by the arresting officer if he had any, any means of support, he pulled out a thousand dollar bill and boldly waved it in front of the amazed policeman's eyes. They immediately released him. In spite of Johnson's increasingly erratic behavior, he was rational and knowledgeable enough to secure for himself an exposition space in the spring at the Kuhlenhof, a well-known art gallery and auction house in Copenhagen. Yet when the exposition of 78 works finally opened on 6th of March, a citywide newspaper strike prevented any of the local art critics from reviewing it, with the exception of the art critic from the Land Og Folk, Copenhagen's communist newspaper. Now following the exposition at Kuhlenhof, Johnson left Copenhagen and traveled by ferry to Oslo, Norway. Friends of Arna Ball, who were also on the ferry boat, later reported to her that Johnson's behavior was outrageous and that he gave all of the other passengers such a cause for anxiety and concern. One incident that several people later relayed to Arna took place in the ferry's fancy, somewhat pretentious dining cafe. William, to everyone's shock, spilled a bottle of red soda water over a pristine piece of white linen that covered his table. The sad truth is that Johnson's deteriorating mental condition and the erratic behavior is triggered, prompted his Danish family and friends to view him increasingly as a stranger, an outsider, a social outcast. Around Easter, Johnson took up residency in a workman's shed in Onslow Wharf. When the police discovered that he was living at this makeshift shelter and asked him to vacate it, Johnson refused, whereupon he was immediately escorted to Onslow's old police station. But unlike the authorities at his last encounter, the Onslow police were not impressed with his large sum of money. They locked him up and placed him under close observation. Before the night was out, however, Johnson was transferred to Oslo's hospital where doctors ran a complete battery of psychological and physical tests on him. Days later, after Johnson was officially diagnosed as suffering from an advanced case of syphilis-induced paralysis, he was transferred to the larger, better-equipped GAST hospital where doctors treated him for his immediate ailment. The disease which he had presumably contracted earlier in his life had already progressed. However, to the point where his, mo his motor skills and mental functions were severely impaired, the doctor saw little hope for recovery or even for a significant marked improvement. Traveling to Norway for an exhibit, he needed clarification and was found lost in the streets. Family and friends in both Denmark and Norway noticed that Johnson's behavior had become increasingly strange, and soon after that, he was diagnosed with a severe mental illness. In 1947, he was sent back to New York, where he was institutionalized in Issyk, Long Island, for the last 23 years of his life until he died in 1970. After he became ill, Johnson's work was stored in a warehouse in New York City and nearly destroyed. The Harmon Foundation, an organization that supported black artists and promoted their work, saved the paintings in the mid-1950s. The Harmon Foundation accommodated his estate of 1,100 works until its closure when it dispersed, dispersed his work among interested organizations. More than 1,300 pieces were given to the Smithsonian National Museum of American Art in 1969. After the museum exhibited his paintings, the importance of Johnson's work was recognized. Johnson's work has been exhibited in South Carolina at the Greenville County Museum of Art in 1993 and a state museum in Columbia in 1995. During his lifetime, Johnson created more than 75 prints. While in Europe, he produced woodcuts and linoleum cuts, usually with 
hand coloring inspired by the raw power of German Expressionism. <laughs> 